Believe it or not, Yu-Gi-Oh! is super dark. And let's be honest with ourselves. The reality of death is actually something very common in the series. You might not think that though if you only watch the dub of the anime as death was heavily disguised in a number of ways throughout the series. With the biggest censorship in the form of the iconic, oh no, he didn't die, he just went to the Shadow Realm. Today, we're gonna peel back the censorship veil that is covering this series and take a look at 10 times that characters in the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series died. So, without further ado, let's jump into the top 10. Starting off this list with the only nice death. That sounds weird, but hear me out. Pharaoh Atem had already sacrificed himself prior to the start of the series, choosing to seal himself and Zork Necrophades inside the Millennium Puzzle to prevent his rampage. After being awakened in the real world by Yugi Moto, he lost all of his memories, and through a series of dramatic adventures, believing in the power of friendship and saving the world countless times, Atem finally understands that his place is no longer among the living, and instead wishes to be set free and allowed to move on to the afterlife. To achieve this goal, the undefeated king of games, a person that can will a card to the top of his deck because his dueling power was that great, needed to be defeated in a duel. But who was up for the task? Why, of course, Yugimoto himself. After a very long and very emotional duel, and through a very symbolic final play of Yugi sealing Monster Reborn inside of Gold Sarcophagus, Yugi is revealed to be victorious, and the door to the afterlife is opened. Pharaoh Atem has a lovely moment where he tells Yugi that a champion shouldn't be on his knees, and congratulates him on his incredible feat. Atem wishes goodbye to all his friends, and finally crosses over into the afterlife, ending the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series on a beautiful note. So with that little bit of niceness out the way, let's get to the dark stuff, shall we? was always a pretty inoffensive character. Yeah, he was a little creepy and wasn't going to win any nice guy awards, but his ultimate fate that he receives in the franchise, well, it was a little extreme, to say the least. Bones made his debut during Duelist Kingdom, wielding a zombie deck. He used it to duel against Joey Wheeler. However, after losing to a pure skill maneuver, we don't see him again until the middle of Battle City, where him and his crew are hanging out in cemeteries trying to scare people and trick them into getting their locator cards. Not ideal. That is, however, until their plan backfires, when Yami Bakura enters the scene. They duel, and through a series of burn effects, Bakura is easily able to prove the superior duelist. And it is here where things take a dark turn. It seems as if taking the locator card and getting into the finals was not enough for Yami Bakura. As in the original Japanese version, Bakura tears open a hole in the earth and summons the minions of hell, which drag Bones and his lackeys down into the deepest, darkest depths of hell. I mean, I didn't know that the Millennium Ring could rip a hole into hell, but apparently it's one of its powers. Maybe they got that from Zork or something. I don't know. You can hear the screams of Bones as he goes down into the pits of hell. And frighteningly, we know that this fate sticks, as from this moment forward, we never see these three characters ever again. What a dark fate for such a small character. Noah Kaiba was the adoptive brother of Mokuba and Seto Kaiba. However, before this, he was the only son of Gozaboru Kaiba. That was until one fateful day. Whilst playing outside, he was hit and killed by a car. Gozaboru, not wanting to lose his one and only heir, decides to digitize his son's brain 
and upload it into the virtual world. Noah would eventually become miserable in his virtual prison. And even worse, Gozaboru Kaiba would move on to a new project, where he started raising his newly adopted son Seto as his future heir. And it's safe to say he didn't treat Seto very well at all. But he would get his comeuppance. Gozaboru would ultimately meet a very dark fate himself. You see, after Kaiba defeated Gozaboru in a battle of wits and acquired Kaiba Corp for himself, Gozaboru was so ashamed that he actually ended his own life. This would explain why he is randomly inside of the virtual world later in the anime series. Regardless though, Noah traps Kaiba and everyone else in the virtual world in an act of pure jealousy, as he attempts to steal Kaiba's body to leave for the real world. However, after a very, very, very long duel, he learns the error of his ways, and finally comes to terms with the fact that he's been long dead and is no longer of this world. And so, in a final act of redemption, Noah sacrifices himself by deleting the entire digital world with him still inside. Scud is no one's favorite character. He records his gang bullying others, and worst of all, deep down, he's nothing but a coward. Scud's ultimate fate is revealed in the Dark Side of Dimensions movie when him and his gang decide to become the mysterious new student, Aigami. Unbeknownst to everyone, Aigami is in fact a very dark and powerful entity that has infiltrated the memories of those that attend Domino High and made it seem like he's been there this entire time. And when the gang attempts to attack him, he immediately whips out his quantum cube. What does he do with this quantum cube? Well, he disintegrates everyone there. And, well, that's it. A very quick one indeed, because they were there, and now they're gone. Shardy was always a mysterious character in the Yu-Gi-Oh! series. Wielding the Millennium Key, he aided the Pharaoh on a few occasions and even helped characters find and wield their own Millennium items. But what if I told you that Shardy was dead the entire time? What a twist! Yes, we learn that in the Dark Side of Dimensions movie, Shardy was killed by Yami Bakura, and afterwards he became an almost omnipresent ghost that would appear when needed. We do see him finally pass on at the end of the series, as the tomb of the pharaoh begins to collapse after the ceremonial game. His spirit is seen disappearing, his soul finally being able to be put to rest. And if that whole thing didn't give you sixth sense vibes, he was dead the whole time, then I don't know what will. You all know this moment. Joey is about to defeat Yami Marik in their Battle City duel. Throughout the Shadow Duel, Marik has made it so that whenever a monster is destroyed, the wielder feels the exact same pain that that monster feels. So, after countless of Joey's monsters have been murdered in all kinds of different ways, Marik's plan is to make Joey simply die from exhaustion. And with his final move of using his Egyptian god, the Winged Dragon of Ra, to set him ablaze, it seems as if Joey will fall. However, he doesn't to Marik's shock. With the last remnants of his life, he attempts to declare an attack and win the duel. But ultimately, he succumbs to his exhaustion and collapses and dies right there. Now, some of you might be saying, you know, he just collapsed. Well, no, actually. The dub made it seem like he simply passed out and was put into a coma. However, peeling back the censorship and looking at the original Japanese, we see that he was actually dead for several minutes and was only resuscitated thanks to Kaiba's medical team. He would eventually awake just in time to witness Yugi summoning his red eyes black dragon against Kaiba. This act gave him enough strength to recover and watch the end of the match. The Millennium 
items, they're not for everyone. But how do you find out if you're not worthy of them? Well, it's quite simple. If you try to use or take them and you're not worthy, well, bad things happen. For Bakura's dad, he tried to take the Millennium Ring. This backfired horrendously. And his ultimate fate, it's left ambiguous. Did he die? Did he not die? You'll have to tell me in the comments. And I mean, even if you don't die, look at Pegasus. He actually passed his test, but the cost of wielding his particular Millennium item was, well, having his eyeballs scooped out. Not ideal. We see a lot more death as consequences in the manga for trying to take Millennium items. However, the anime does show one such scene. And this is when Solomon Muto is seeking the Millennium puzzle. One of the guides that he is with slips and falls into a chasm and dies due to the booby traps. The second guide, after whipping out a gun on Solomon, well, he steps on and desecrates a monster trap. As a result, he is munched on to a mulchy paste. Looking at the guy's face and the sound of the feasting afterwards, it's truly haunting. Basically, if you're not a main character, do not mess with any of the Millennium items. In fact, sticking with the Millennium items, let's talk about their creation for a second. Similar to the victims of the Millennium Items, it turns out in order to create the most powerful magical items in existence, what you need to create it is to enact one of the most horrific unspeakable acts of evil a person can do. And what is that act? Well, it's sacrificing 99 human souls. And not just that, but melting them down in a smelting pot and using their searing human remains as a catalyst to create the mystical items. Yeah, that's right. Priest Seto, the brother of the Pharaoh, enacted this horror in order to gain the power necessary to defeat an invading army. He did this for his country and knew the horrors that he committed would never be forgiven. The souls that were sacrificed were those of criminals from a local village. Only one person survived the massacre, and it was none other than a young Bakura, who saw everything unfold with his own eyes. I can kind of understand why Yami Bakura is so messed up now. kids with three loving families. Darts comes along and kills them all. But why did he do this? Well, he did it in order to motivate them to serve his cause. Raphael's family drowned at sea due to darts steering the ship into a storm. Alistair's family killed by a Kyber Corp tank that was driven by none other than darts in disguise. And Valon, who was himself already an orphan, well, he had his orphanage burned to the ground, with the nun who looked after him trapped inside. And that's not all. Following that event, after being sent to prison, through darts, he was tricked into fighting the other inmates. These horrific acts would haunt the soldiers of Doma for the rest of their lives. And I guess if he wanted to throw one more death into the mix, Darts did kill his own wife after she transformed into a wicked beast. I mean, she did try to kill him, but there was no hesitation in this moment. And that was before he got corrupted as well. So, I don't know. Make of that what you will. <laughs> Finally, at number one, Mr. Ishtar. Now, Marek Ishtar's dad, not a good person. In fact, some would say he deserved the wicked fate that he received. But let's go back a bit. When Mr. Ishtar was young, he had the Pharaoh's stone tablet symbol carved onto his back at the age of 12. This act was done because... He was a tomb keeper. The plan was to eventually have his son, when he turned of age, have the same thing done to him. Eventually, he was given a son in the form of Marek. However, Marek's birth began with tragedy, as his mother died in childbirth. When the day finally came, he used the Millennium Rod to carve the Pharaoh symbol onto his son's back. As he did so, he ignored his son's protests of pain. 
From this traumatic event, Marek, unbeknownst to even himself, created an alternate persona. This alternate persona was a method to deal with some of the more traumatic things that would happen in his life. I didn't mention up until this point, but Marek had an adoptive brother, Odeon. Mr. Ishtar did not like Odeon. And after Marek was caught having snuck out of his tomb, Mr. Ishtar punished Odeon in a very severe way. As the punishment took place, Marek's alternate persona took stage. And using the Millennium Rod, he would pin his father to the wall. And through the cries of his sister, Ishizu, he would stab his father to death. You'll never look at the Millennium Rod the same way, for sure. In fact, it gets a little bit more sinister in the manga, as Yami Marek instead cuts all of the skin off of his father and then throws it onto the unconscious body of Odeon. After this event, Marek wasn't the same person. And after a visit from Shadi, decides that the Pharaoh is his true enemy. And with that, that was my top 10 dark deaths in Yu-Gi-Oh. If you'd like to see this for GX, Zexal, Arc 5, and things like that, let me know in the comment section below. But other than that, thank you all for watching. Catch you later. Bye, everyone.